do just that. Let's praise the Lord. Jesus is here. His presence is real. We've been walking with Jesus throughout the whole week, and now we get to come to church and worship Him together. So let somebody stand up and let's sing. Hallelujah for the cross.
with your blood you you part my freedom hallelujah for the cross amen hey guys welcome to church i'm excited about having church amen like this week's been crazy and we get to come to church to worship and praise jesus so what we're going to do here in just a moment I want to pay, pay close attention to those of you who are first time. Man, we've been having first time guests every single week. And so you could be anywhere, but you chose to be here at Greystone. And we're so thankful. We're going to move into a time of meeting and greeting before we worship. So what does that mean? Meet and greet. This is what this means. Hey, my name is Josh. Lauren, oh, nice to meet you. Oh, cool. Oh, that's how it is, right? There's the example. You guys do that right now. Meet somebody new. Go ahead.
some noise for the Lord this morning. Come on. We're doing a new song called Praise You Anywhere. You may have heard it on the radio. Even if you don't know it, you can just clap your hands, sing along. We're talking about praise. we can praise Jesus anywhere, in church or outside of the building. Let's sing. Sometimes you've got to dance through the darkness, sing through the fire, praise when it don't make sense. Sometimes you've got to stare down the giant, worship from the lion's den. Sometimes you've got to shout it from the mountain, louder in the valley, trusting that he's gonna get you there. Sometimes you've got to welcome the wonder, wait for the answer, worship with your hands in the air. I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest Have a seat. Welcome to Greystone Church. My name is Justin Wojak, and it is so great to have you here with us this morning. I want everybody to raise your communication card. Talk notes right here. There's like four people. Great. This is going to be great. That's what I'm talking about. All right. So if you have this in your hand on the very bottom, this is our communication card. So I want to pay attention to this, lock your eyes on this. So on the very bottom, there's a couple options up top and on the bottom. So if this is your first time, man, we are so excited that you are here with us this morning. Check that and we'll make a $5 donation in your honor to our local food bank. You can do something great on your first visit. And then on the bottom, we have a couple different options. We have baptism. So baptisms, we get to celebrate every month at the end of every month. And this is people that are taking their relationship with Jesus to that next level, just publicly confessing 
I have decided to give my life to Christ. And so if you're interested or if you have questions or if you're feeling led to do that, mark that and we would love to follow up with you so then that way we can celebrate you next week. The next option is our newcomers class. And so this is an amazing time that you get to have some, uh, some time with our lead pastor's wife, Jennifer, as she shares the history of Greystone, but more importantly, what makes us different than any other church and how you and your family can get involved. And so that is actually today after our second service in the aquarium room. So that's through those doors to the right. Uh, we have childcare and lunch provided. And so again, you want to be sure you check that on that box or just show on up. And then we also have small groups. Uh, if you've been here the past couple weeks, we have been doing nothing but talking about how amazing small groups are. And so if that is you, if you have questions, if you have no idea about what small groups is, check that. And again, we would love to follow up with you. So as we move into a time of giving now, uh, this is something that we love to do at Greystone Church. This is, this is something that we do just not because the Bible or God asks us to do it, but man, in our hearts, we are so thankful that we get to continue worship Him through our tithes and our offerings. So join me in prayer. Before we do that, we have four ways to give. Uh, we make it super easy for y'all because we want you and your family to experience your relationship with Jesus on a whole new level. You can give right now. We have uh, two giving kiosks out in the lobby. Uh, they're super easy. You just plug in your information, you swipe swipe your card and boom, that is it. And then you can mail a check, text to give. Again, we wanna make it super easy for y'all. So let's pray this morning. Lord God, we thank you, Jesus, so much for who you are, God. We thank you for dying on the cross and saving us of our sins, Lord Jesus. And we just ask, God, that you will be with us this morning, God, that you'll prepare our hearts for the message that you have, Lord God. And we just thank you for this opportunity to give. God, we thank you so much, um, Jesus, that we can give freely. God, we can worship you freely. And so, God, we just ask that you will bless uh, this offering to, ex to extend your name across this area. In your name that we pray, amen. Amen. So in your seats, we have small group booklets. And like we've been saying the past couple of weeks, or if this is your first time, this is a great opportunity for you to really get connected to Graystone. We have small groups for every stage of life, every area that you could think we have a small group for you. So take a look through that booklet and later today you'll have an opportunity to join in. But most importantly, I want you to hear from a couple from our, uh, from our Monroe campus about the power that small groups had in their life and in their marriage. So y'all take a look at this. We were dating at the time and we just started going to Greystone. And um, I want to be involved together, but also individually as well. And um, so I said the best way to get started is just to sign up for a group. So I went, I ended up in Kim Parker's group and we all became very quickly great friends. If you're one of those that just comes to church or tries to slip in and slip out, but you're looking for a way to really build relationships and meet people, it's the, it's the biggest way to do it because even if it's five people, by the end of that small group, y'all are gonna be really great friends and you'll never be able to slip in and out of church again. Going into book one, I thought I knew quite a bit about the Bible and then it broke down a lot more. It made me a lot of aware of a lot of things that I either had questions about, like I didn't realize I had questions, but I actually did and so it answered. But I can bring what I've learned to the outside world and it be like a small moment where I can disciple somebody for a brief moment, even by how I, you know, act or just what I have learned that is very simplified. I feel like I get fed. You know, it's, it's different than going to church on Sunday. Um, you just get a more intimate setting. You get closer with your group and I just feel I feel revived and uplifted on Wednesday afternoon just to finish out the week. I feel like a lot of people know that God loves them, but they miss out on certain parts of who God is. And this is a great opportunity to learn more about this. Sometimes, you know, people at work maybe bring you down, work brings you down, what happens at home brings you down, but you have this small group to lean on. You have God to lean on, but you have this small group to help you and pray for you. And knowing that someone is gonna pray for you is an awesome encouragement. I 
I love hearing stories of small group and how small groups have changed people's lives. Uh, for me personally, it's been the context of a small group. That's the place that I've grown the most spiritually, and that's the place that I've made the closest friends, like like-minded friends. And that's what we're talking about today. I'm talking about surrounding ourselves with the right kinds of of people, and so we're in the middle of this, spe- this series, spaces and places and and faces. And the first week we talked about uh, the the holy place, the sacred place, living in the presence of God. And then last week we talked about the the space that we're standing on, that we're we're building our lives upon the firm foundation of God's word. And today we're talking about the faces, the people that we surround ourselves. With and 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 so so visually, uh, from above where we're in the presence of God, like th- we're in the presence, we're, we're two or more gathering His name. We're in His presence. He is here with us. We're building our lives. We're standing on the firm foundation of God's word. We're not living our lives like the rest of the world. We talked about this last week. We're living our lives according to the truth of God's word. So that's what we're standing on. And then around us are the people. We're surrounding ourselves with the right kind of people. We're in Psalm chapter one. I'm gonna read the first three verses and then we're gonna dive in today. It says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither and they prosper in all they do. Verse one says, Do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. The faces that we surround ourselves with are of utmost importance. If you're taking notes, you become like the people you spend time with. You become like the people you spend time with. If you walk with the wicked, you will become wicked. If you stand around with sinners, it will lead to a sinful activity. 1 Corinthians 15, says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. You could be a person of good character, but if you're spending all of your time with bad company, you are going to pick up some bad habits. You become like the people you spend time with. We are a product of our environment. It's interesting to me how influenced we are by the people that are around us. So so I grew up in South Mississippi, along the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Uh, We moved there when I was four or five years old. We moved to to Long Beach, Mississippi. Now my dad worked in Gulfport, Mississippi, but we we moved to Long Beach. And Long Beach was a small town. It's more of a rural town. It was a country town. So growing up, uh, we had woods behind our house. I, I rode dirt bikes in the woods. We, we shot BB guns. We, we went hunting. I played baseball. Many of you have heard the story. I don't know if you've heard this story or not, but Little League All-Stars, 12 years old, struck out Brett Favre. It's kind of my claim to fame. Y'all can applaud it if you want. Um, but growing up in Gulfport, it was country. I wore blue jeans. Cowboy boots, T-shirt, sometimes a cowboy hat. I wanted a stepside pickup truck, so I thought that was cool, right? Amen. So then, <laughs> it's the Alabama fan. <laughs> so my sophomore year, so we had junior high, so we in, in junior high, ninth grade. Tenth grade, we moved to Gulfport. Bigger city, completely different culture. So... In, in Gulfport, it was preppy. I went from wearing blue jeans and T-shirts to wearing you know, polo shirts and saddlebuck Oxfords. I was in a high school fraternity, right? I, I went from playing baseball to playing tennis, like the country club type sports, right? Um, I went from wanting a stepside pickup truck to wanting a BMW. <laughs> I went from wanting to go to Mississippi State with the cowbells to wanting to go to Ole Miss in the grove and, and the preppy and, and all of that. We, we are a product of our environment. It's fascinating to think about how, how the people around us affect who we are. You become like the people you spend time with. If you spend time with people who listen to country music all the time, 
you're probably going to listen to country music. If you spend time with people who drink alcohol all the time, you're probably going to drink alcohol. If you spend time with people who eat healthy and work out, you're probably going to eat healthy and work out. If you spend time with people who live a materialistic lifestyle, you're probably going to live a materialistic lifestyle. If you spend time with people who play video games all day, you're probably going to play video games all day. If you spend time with people who are bird watchers, <laughs> you're probably going to become a bird watcher. Now, Jennifer's taking this bird watching thing to a whole nother level. I woke up yesterday morning and I haven't even got to my coffee yet. And Jennifer's like, I, I made my own hummingbird juice and the hummingbirds are loving it. And there's like six hummingbirds flying around and she's telling me all about this. Well, then it gets even crazier. So someone in our church bought Jennifer a bird feeder with a video camera, <laughs> right? So anytime a bird comes to this bird feeder, she gets up, she, gets, she has an app on her phone and it notifies her, you've got a little visitor today. <laughs> Somebody's come by the house to see you. And she opens up her phone and she can watch the birds from anywhere in the world. <laughs> J Jennifer's really scaring me. She's, uh, she's gotten into pickleball and she's talking about wanting to be the senior adult pastor of the church and take people on trips, you know? So we're, we're, at, we're at a whole nother level. I think you guys get the point. You become like the people you spend time with. So spend time with people that you wanna be like, right? If you become like the people you spend time with, you want to spend time with people that you want to be like. You wanna spend time with people that make you a better person. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. You wanna spend time with people that are, that are gonna make you a better person, that are, that are going to sharpen you. Surrounding yourself with the right group of people. This has been a theme on the Family Goals podcast. So the Family Goals podcast with David Pollock and Pastor Jay, which by the way, season five kicks off tomorrow, all right? Tomorrow morning, season five. If you don't subscribe to the podcast, you're in the minority <laughs> because thousands and thousands of people all over the world are subscribing to this podcast. So pull out your phone, go to the podcast app, search, Family Goals with David Pollock and Pastor Jay, it'll pop up, push the plus sign on the right, that'll subscribe you, you'll automatically get it first thing on Monday mornings, okay? So tomorrow's episode is a powerful one because I actually interview Davey and we talk about everything that went down with ESPN and he wasn't expecting it and he talks about getting the phone call and having to have the conversation with his kids and all that God has been doing in and through his life since he's no longer with College Game Day, and I think he was with College Game Day for like 13 years. It is a powerful episode. But one of the things we talk about many times on the podcast is you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Who you surround yourself with determines who you are and who your kids, listen parents, who your kids surround themselves with determines who they are, who they become. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Show me your friends and I will show you your future. Now, one of the things that came out of the, out of the COVID pandemic, one of the, one of the difficult things that, that came through, came out of what all of us went through is people have become isolated and lonely. People have disconnected, especially our kids, disconnected from real relationships. And people don't know how to interact and connect with other human beings. And this has led to depression, it's led to mental health issues, and even suicide. See, God created us as relational beings. And we, we talked about this two weeks ago, that first we have a relationship with God, that's, that's a vertical relationship. That is eternal life, to come to know Jesus. He created us in his image to have a relationship with him. 
And then we're to have horizontal relationships. He created us to live in fellowship, in relationship with other human beings, okay? We need friendships. We not only need friends, but we need like-minded friends. We need Christian friends. We need friends, as, as I talked about last week, who have the same biblical worldview that we have, that their family and their kids, they're raising their kids with the same values that we are raising our kids with. We need, we need friends who are gonna encourage us in our relationship with God. We need friends who are gonna, gonna come to church with us and, and worship God with us, friends who are gonna pray with us, pr- friends who are gonna study the Bible with us. Now, this may sound elementary and basic, but every one of us needs a group of like-minded Christian friends to do life together. You need Christian friends, and your kids need Christian friends. So our daughter, Jessie, she's 15 years old. She's a sophomore at Loganville High School. She has a high value of friendship. And the funny thing with Jessie is she differentiates between uh, acquaintances and friends. I don't know if your kids do the same thing. So I'll be asking Jesse, well, well, tell me about this friend. She'll say, well, well, she's not really a friend. She's just an acquaintance. So she has a very high standard of what, what a friend is. And then within a friendship, she has, she has different levels of friends, right? Oh, well, that's just a school friend. Oh, well, that's just a church friend. But then the highest level of friendship, like in her mind, is someone that you would invite over to the house. And then even greater than that would be someone who, would, who spends the night. Right? That, that, that's like the highest level of friendship. True biblical fellowship is a much deeper level of Christian friendship. True biblical fellowship, okay? We're not talking about guys coming over, drinking beer and watching the game. That's not called fellowship. That's called partying, okay? (laughs) Acts 2, 42 through 47. This, This is a description of the first church, the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They they worshiped together daily. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. This this is the model of the church. This is what we're trying to model our church after is the first church, the early church. This is known as the fellowship of believers. Says they were devoted to four things. The one thing I want to focus on, verse 42 says, they devoted themselves to the fellowship. What does it mean to be devoted to something? So we, we have devoted fans, right? We have, we, have a, we have a lot of devoted fans. Do we have any people who are devoted to the Georgia Bulldogs? All right, few. A few, I thought I would get a little higher response than that. Those people who are devoted to the Georgia Bulldogs, which you notice I didn't say Georgia Tech, because the illustration would, wouldn't play out as well. I'm looking at some Tech fans. So if you're devoted to the Georgia Bulldogs, you probably know the schedule. You probably know who Georgia plays first game. You probably know every schedule. You probably know the home games and away games. You probably know who the coach is or several of the coaches. You probably know some of the key players. You probably know who the quarterback is. Who who are the All-Americans on this team, right? You probably, and I'm seeing seeing some Georgia swag today. You probably have like a a Georgia hat or a Georgia shirt. Like, like you've got the gear, you've got the swag. Like you're devoted, you're committed. Now, if you're a season ticket holder for the Georgia Bulldogs, that means you're really invested because you have to give tens of thousands of dollars to the university just to have enough points, right? To have the opportunity to buy some tickets, right? And if you have a tailgate spot, 
you're getting there early, you got a tailgate spot, there, there's food, and there's TV, and there's music. Like, like you are dedicated. You are sold out. If they're in the national championship game, like you're, you're going, right? I don't know where the national championship game is this year, but some of you already know where it is, right? Because George is, George is two-time national champion, number, preseason number one. But LSU's coming. <laughs> LSU's coming. I'm not trying to get my hopes up. I'm not getting my hopes up. What do you think it means to be devoted to fellowship? That's a high, high priority, high commitment. Investment of time, investment of money, investment into relationships. Like it's a priority uh, in our lives. First Thessalonians 2, 8 says, we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well because you had become so dear to us. I wanna share five characteristics of true biblical fellowship. Number one is authenticity. People are real with each other. It's below the surface relationships. We grow deep in relationships. In true fellowship, we're not putting on masks. We are honest and open with each other. First John 1, 7 and 8 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Authenticity, confessing our sins to each other, sharing our faults with one another, sharing our struggles. When, when, we're, when, when our faith is struggling, when we have a lack of faith and we don't understand why things are happening the way that they're happening, it's being honest and open and, and real with people. It's authentic, it's not fake. A second characteristic of true biblical fellowship is grace. We're real, but we also extend grace. Amen. We love each other no matter what. We extend, extend grace and mercy to one another. Mistakes are not rubbed in, they're rubbed out. Second Corinthians 2, 7 says, when people sin, you should forgive and comfort them so they won't give up in despair. I was thinking about uh, one of our small groups back in the day, uh, us men used to meet at Kenny Rogers' basement on sunny nights. Kenny Rogers, the famous toilet salesman, <laughs> not the famous uh, country music star, but we met at Kenny Rogers' basement and a uh, group of men for years and years and years. And, and one, of the, one of the guys in our group came in one sunny night and he had missed church that morning. And we asked him where he was. And he, he broke down and he started crying. And he confessed to us that he'd gotten a DUI, he had too much to drink the night before, he'd, he'd gotten a DUI. And we wrapped our arms around him and we were all crying together and we were praying for him. There was no judgment. It was mercy, it was grace, it was love. In true biblical fellowship, we extend mercy, we extend grace. Right. We're there to pick each other, because we're gonna fall, right? Nobody's perfect. We all stumble, we all fall. And we're there to pick each other up. You cannot have fellowship without forgiveness. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10 says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Third characteristic is accountability. We hold each other accountable to living our lives how God wants us to live our lives. Ephesians 5, 21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We are to correct, rebuke, and instruct our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we do it with love, gentleness, and respect. Number four, give and take relationships. Fellowship is a two-way street. If you want someone to be there for you, then you have to be there for them. Acts 2.45 says that they gave to each person as he had need. And in our small groups, in our fellowship, 
We develop such a close relationship with the people in our group that if they call us and they reach out to us and they have a need, it doesn't matter what that need is, we're, we're, we're gonna go, right. right? We're gonna be there for them. And it's the same, if we have a need and we reach out to them, they are going to be there for us. Romans 14, 19 says, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual, mutual edification. It's mutual, right? It's a give and take relationship. And then number five, caring for one another. In true fellowship, we love and care for one another. We're there for each other in the good times and the bad times. Now I wanna talk about three levels of fellowship, okay? The first level of fellowship is the fellowship of sharing. This is the simplest level of fellowship. We might share a meal together or, or, or we share what's going on in our life or we share what, what God is teaching us from the scriptures. You know, all of our small groups, we have a share time. Hey, what's going on with you? What's God doing in your life? Maybe we break bread together. Maybe, maybe we share a meal together. A deeper level of fellowship is serving. And that's where we're serving together. We're doing ministry together. Now, at Greystone, across all of our campuses, we have dozens and dozens of volunteer teams and serving teams. So we have, we have a parking team, and we have, we have first impressions, we have coffee bar, and we have student ministry team, and children's ministry team, and cleaning team, you know, ad administration team, landscape team. We have all of these teams, and you, get, you develop a special bond with people because you're serving together. You're, you're serving on all of these ministry teams together. Like our student ministry team, all, all the volunteers who serve in student ministry, it's a tight-knit group because they're serving together. They're doing life together. So we serve on our ministry teams. In two weeks, we have Greystone serves. So we're meeting at all of our campuses in, in the morning. Instead of having regular church, we're going out in the community and serving. And the theme that day is don't go to church, be the church. And just to Give a little sneak peek, we're bringing, we're bringing back the shirts. Those are some of the favorite shirts. Don't go to church, be the church. We're giving up free t-shirts to everybody who serves that day. Several of the people in the church that I met for the very first time was on the serving team, like Greystone Serves. Like we went out and served together and we got to know each other and we built friendships and we're like, you know, serving together. Serving on mission trips. The crazy thing about mission trips is you always have some funny stories. Right, and you have these bonds, and all the mission trips I've been on, there's the, the people that I went on the mission trip with, there's this, there's this special bond. I think about our Scotland trip. Got some of the Scotland people here. We, we were flying out of Atlanta. There was, uh, it was raining, there's a storm. Our, our flight got delayed, so when we got to Boston, we missed the flight to Scotland. So we all had to stay in hotels that night, and we woke up the next day, and the flight wasn't until that night, so we had the whole day in Boston just to hang out. It, it, we're talking July. July 20th, it's hot in Boston. So by the time we all got back to the airport, back to the hotel there at the airport, everybody was sweaty and we didn't want to get on a, on a flight all, all sweaty. Well, the Sexton still had their, their key to their room. They had not turned in their key to their room and it was still open. So we all showered in the Sexton shower. <laughs> not together, not at the same time. <laughs> and Jennifer, the first lady of the church, went, went to the maid's closet and stole towels for everybody. So we, we have these funny stories. We come, come walking in one morning and, and Steve Sexton's got a, a Dunkin' Donut sandwich and he, he asked Jennifer if, if she wanted some and she just took it and she just bit right where, right where he had been biting and it freaked Jamie Barwick out. Like he's, he's like, what? Did, you didn't even twist the sandwich? Like you, you, bit, like you bit right there on the bite? You know, these mission trips, where you develop these friendships, these relationships, and you, you're doing life together. I think about the, the group of people that we went, we went to South Africa with, the, the people we went to Haiti with, the people we went to Honduras with, the people we went to Brazil with. Like, you have all of these stories and all of these relationships because you have this fellowship of serving God together, and that's the next level of fellowship. And the deepest level of fellowship is suffering. It's the fellowship of suffering. When you walk with someone through their pain and through their suffering, it develops a bond 
a very deep bond of fellowship. You know, this year in in our church, we've had so many people lose loved ones. We we're, we're, at, we're at, Jennifer and I are at the age and our friends are at the age that, that our parents are beginning to pass away. We have so many people in the church. Uh, Elizabeth lost her mom last Sunday. She went home to heaven. Uh, tomorrow, I'm officiating David Mooney's mom's service over, over in Roswell. Uh, and I could, the list could go on and on. Many, many of you. But Jennifer's mom passed away uh, earlier this year. And it, it's been a challenge. It's, it's still a challenge. But the bond that we developed with the people, like the people who came to Jennifer's mom's memorial service, it meant the world to us. That, that you would show up. We love our church. That you would show up and you would come. The, the, the people that, that brought food, the people that sent cards, the people that sent flowers and, and plants. You know, the Strickland sent us a plant beautiful arrangement, it's, it's on our kitchen table. Like it, it's still sitting on our kitchen table right now. My men's small group, my men's establishment group sent us this beautiful plant. It's at the foyer of our house. It's, it's the first thing you see when you walk through the doors of our house. Somebody else sent us a pink dogwood. We planted it in the backyard right by one of the bird feeders. People sent us wind chimes, bird feeders, cards, you, you, you name it. When, when you walk through suffering with someone, you develop a strong bond. When you walk through cancer with someone, like someone's battling cancer, and you're walking through that with them, and you're praying over them, and you're sending them encouraging texts, and you're visiting them in the hospital, it's a deep level of fellowship. The fellowship of suffering together. When you walk with someone through a divorce, when you walk with someone through losing their job and you reach out to them and you say, I'm praying for you and God's got this. When, when you walk with someone through suffering, there's this strong bond. Denise Rabin, I don't see her here today. She might be at the Monroe campus, but I'll never forget. I mean, Denise and I have a very special bond because her 16-year-old daughter, was killed in a, in a car wreck by a drunk driver. Jennifer and I got the phone call. We were in bed, it's like midnight. And I'll never forget getting up and going over there. Mark Hanley and I have a special bond because Mark went with me. And I'll never forget walking in that living room with Denise and her family and about 40 high school kids. And we opened the scriptures together and we prayed together and we walked through that journey together I don't, I don't prepare a sermon without thinking about Denise. Because we, we have this special, special bond. I think, I think about Clancy. When, I, when Isaiah was in the car wreck and his body caught on fire and he was rushed to the burn center in, in Augusta, there were people in our church, they just got in the car and went just, just to be with Clancy just to be with his family, just to let him know, we love you, we care for you, we're, we're here for you. That is, that is family. I think about Whit Smith. He was in a shooting accident in Arkansas and some men, some dads and sons from their small group just got in the car, drove to Arkansas just to be with him, just to see him and spend time with him this fellowship of suffering. The parent and prodigal small group, I, I assume has a deep level of fellowship because they've been suffering together and walking through this journey together. Celebrate recovery. I see the Celebrate Recovery folks interacting with one another. They have a deep fellowship. They have a deep friendship because, because they're, they're, they're walking through their hurts and their habits and their hangups together. It's a deeper fellowship. It's a deeper friendship. It's a deeper relationship. Jennifer's starting grief share next week. They're gonna be sharing in each other's grief. When you walk with someone through their pain, it is a deeper level of fellowship. 
1 Corinthians 12, 26 and 27 says, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ and each of you is a part of it. When one part of the church suffers, we all suffer. When one part of the body suffers, we all suffer together. I want to encourage you, if you're not in a small group, to join a small group. Don't wait for the storm of life to come, because it's coming. It, it comes for all of us. And you wanna have a group of people who is there for you. And even more importantly than that, you wanna be there for them. Like you, you wanna be there for them in their time of need. So the application today is very simple. It's to join a small group. Okay, we're, we're, I'm encouraging every single person. I mean, if it was up to me, I would make you join a small group. Like, like it'd be a requirement of the church. Like you, you need to be in a small group. And there's some of you who haven't been in a small group. It's been a, it's been a minute, right? It's been a while. Uh, I wanna encourage you to get back in. And for others of you, maybe you've never been in a small group and it just scares you because you think you're gonna have to pray out loud or you're gonna have to read the Bible out loud or you're gonna have to talk. Listen, we, we have guys who come to our men's discipleship group, they don't say anything. Now we have some guys that talk way too much. <laughs> um, but we have other guys who don't say anything, right? They just sit there. They're, they're just soaking it in. So you don't, don't you, no one's gonna put you on the spot. It, it's, it's a 10 to 12 week commitment. I'd encourage you to do it. Who are, who, are the, who are the people you're surrounding yourself with? You, you are the sum of those people. And I wanna encourage you to get into a group of like-minded friends. You can study the Bible together, you can pray for each other, and you can be there together. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you so much that you created us as relational beings. First and foremost, you created us to have a relationship with you God, I pray there's anyone here who doesn't know you, anyone at our Monroe or our Coney, anyone watching online, listening to the podcast. If they don't know you, God, I pray they would come to know you today. And if that's you, you just say, God, I wanna know you. I wanna have a relationship with you. And God, you create us to have fellowship, like true biblical fellowship. Not surface relationships, but authentic relationships, real relationships. And I, I pray, God, you would lead each person in our church to find that group of Christian friends to do life with, to share the goods and to share the bads, to serve together, and also to share in our, in our sufferings together. God, we thank you for our church, the love everybody has for each other. It's a beautiful thing. And I pray, God, each person can find their place, not only their place of service, but their place of small group. And we pray it all in Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, so we, structured, we structured the service a little bit different today. So we're done. It's over, right? The application is to go join a small group. Now we've got all of our small groups represented in the lobby. Okay, if anyone sees someone walking out the door without going to the small group table, I want you to tackle them. <laughs> no, we, we really do want, any questions you have, they can answer your questions. You can sign up for small group uh, right then. Uh, the band's just gonna play us out. We're dismissed. You guys go join a small group and we'll see you next Sunday.